We've had the good fortune to host our guest a number of times since the millennium struck. In 2002 for his novel, July, July. In 2005 for the things they carried as part of one book, one Philadelphia. And for the 20th anniversary edition of hashtag 3TC in 2010. And now tonight, Dad's Maybe book. One thing is for sure, because of his fine writing and storytelling, hearts were moved. I expect no less this evening because Tim's themes are the verities. Love, death, courage, right, wrong, truth, time, memory, family, and how we make meaning through the stories that we choose to tell. It's the stuff that gives our lives value. His writing and talent have been compared to and keep company with some of the greats. Names like Crane, Tolstoy, Orwell, and Melville, the Hebrew scriptures. And yet, he couldn't be more approachable. It's an honor to have him back. Please welcome Tim O'Brien. So I think you've written a wonderful memoir, and it addresses so many different subjects. A love letter to the boys, an instruction manual for life, a guide to writing and literary analysis, a consideration of the culture, other things as well. But before we talk about any of that, how did you get to be 73? <laughs> <laughs> I should have been dead years ago. I was in Vietnam, I'm a smoker. Got two boys that almost killed me you know, numerous times. Um, good luck. That's We're how I get it. We're glad you made it this far. So what is a maybe book? Well, there are numerous answers. Uh, one is anecdotal, that I uh, became a father at age 58 for the first time and uh, decided that, that I had to quit writing to be a good dad. I'm a slow writer. I was spending 12, 15 hours a day at it. And a father's chief duty is to be there, to be present beyond anything else. You can't instruct and you can't discipline and be nice to your children and teach them values if you aren't there. And I wasn't. I was at the t computer all the time. And if I wasn't at the computer, I was worried about a sentence or about a scene or a scrap of dialogue. So uh, I had to quit. And I did for about 10 years or so. Every, occasionally, I would write a little message to the boys. As I got older, I started worrying that I'd be dead and they'd never know me. So I tried to give them little messages in a bottle and tucked in a desk drawer. Stories about my youth and about Vietnam and about their youths. Some of them funny anecdotes, some of them really sad. And so they'd hear my voice coming through the vowels and the consonants of what I was writing. These pages added up to maybe 40 of them or so. And at one point when my youngest boy was uh, seven or so, he saw the pages stacked up on my desk and he said, what's that? And I said, they're letters to you. And he said, is that gonna be a book? And I said, maybe. <laughs> and uh, I said, sometimes books end up in the trash can. They're not good enough. Uh, you can't you, you hit a block in the road, and there's no way through the block, and you just can't think of what next. And he said, well, what if it does become one? Um, I think you have to call it your maybe book. That is, call it, what it, call it what it is. And I kind of chuckled, and I didn't take it all that seriously, but after a day or two, I thought, well, in my life, the, the, just the idea of maybeness is maybe the dominant th uh, theme that runs throughout it. In Vietnam, every step was maybe I'll be alive and the neck for the next step, or maybe I won't. Uh, my area of operations in Vietnam was, was heavily mined. And 85, 90% of our casualties came from landmines. So every step was maybe. Maybe I'll have another step, maybe not. 
And then you come into the age of 73, which I am now, and every tick of the clock is a maybe tick. Maybe there'll be another, you know, tomorrow. And then I thought, after another day or so, that there was something wise in what Tad had suggested in that all of us, in some way or another, are writing our own maybe books. Maybe our dreams will come true. Maybe they won't. Maybe we'll change our dreams, have new ones, modify the old ones. That's certainly how my life has been. Uh, dreams change. I did not want to be a father. And now I walked into this blessed, beautiful, impossible fantasy of a dream that I thought was not in my future. And it's been my life. Can you give us a brief sketch of each of the boys? I know they're listening tonight, so you'll have to be careful. <laughs> yeah, this is being streamed on YouTube, so they're watching this. This is embarrassing a little bit. Um, uh, Timmy is an earnest, stubborn, kind kid who, who uh, has a quality of empathy that is way beyond what I have now. I used to have it as a little boy. I now when I see a homeless person, I might give a buck or two out of a kind of embarrassment, and I might not. And uh, like, to answer the question with Timmy, the best way possible is in a little anecdote, I suppose, that that's what I do for a living is tell stories. And there, we were in the south of France on vacation when, the, when Timmy was, I think, seven and Tad was five at a resort that was way too expensive for us. We didn't know this at the time. It was like a place that was populated by George Hamilton kind of people, with bronze skin, and everybody looked like Johnny Depp. And the, it was, they were all rich and bejeweled, and we were so out of place. I was dressed like this, only not this well. <laughs> and uh, I got a call. We were outside, my wife and I, having a, a $25,000 glass of Coca-Cola. <laughs> and uh, the, the phone rang, and it was my sister calling from San Antonio, and my mom had died. And she told me that. And uh, maybe... I don't know, five minutes later, I went over to the boys who were playing ping pong on an outdoor ping pong table. And I told them that my mom had died, and they didn't say much, and I didn't say much. And for the next two hours or so, all we did was silently play ping pong, which was much like what was happening in my head. Images of my mom at different ages, and but we were all silent. And then gradually dusk began to fall and we went to dinner. And we, because this resort was so expensive, we would go down to a little village to eat to save, you know, $10,000. <laughs> and and uh, on the way down, it's this beautiful purple twilight and the yachts are bobbing on the blue Mediterranean. And I took Timmy's hand and I said, are you thinking about Grandma? And he said, no. I'm thinking about you, thinking about Grandma. So that's the kind of boy he is. He cries over uh, people who are standing out on the street as he's driven home from school. He wants mom to stop the car and give them money. I found him one morning at five in the morning packing a little grocery bag full of presents for a man he had seen wearing a, a Vietnam hat who was crying on the street himself. And he put in a granola bar and uh, an apple, uh, some fishing line, the strangest stuff, a yo-yo, <laughs> yeah, a copy of one of my books. <laughs> Was it one you had assigned to him to read? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, Tad is the opposite. Tad is the funniest guy I've ever been around. He should be up here instead of this guy. You would have a ball with this guy talking to you. 
He takes on personalities. He's got a character called Fish Man. And he's got another called another man called Fat Man Running. Got another you know, got all these characters and the faces change and the stories coming out of his mouth change. He will do and say anything. It doesn't have to be appropriate, doesn't have to be germane. It just has to be entertaining. And entertainment is important in life. There's sublime entertainment and there's, you know, low level. But entertainment is great for the soul when we're, we're engaged and we're it's good for us. And boy, is he. Um, he too is, has a kind heart. And uh, more than anything, I mean, the two boys, what I value is, is generosity of spirit and decency and kindness. So can you talk a bit about how we learn from our children? I think that was sort of something of a surprise for you, or maybe not. Yes. And that sort of goes to impart the story you were just telling. What a, it's so important that you, you start out thinking you're going to instruct your children, and they end up instructing you. The anecdote I just told is one example. I, mean, I relearned the lesson of sympathy and empathy and otherness. Another anecdote with Tad is one night we were watching a basketball game on television. It was a playoff game. And in the middle of the game, Tad said, Hey, Dad, how old was that guy in the Bible, Methuselah? <laughs> and I said, I don't know, a thousand years old? And then we watched the game for an hour. And then he said, what exactly did he eat? <laughs> and, well, if I, like you guys, I laughed. But after he was dreaming his little boy dreams two hours later, sound asleep, I started thinking, he's looking at, I'm Methuselah. <laughs> and he wants to give me my broccoli so I'll stay alive longer. <laughs> And I, I really think that's what the, was behind the question. Yeah. And that's a kind of learning, the way that the, 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 the awareness of... I took it for... I, I assumed that children of his age back then, at eight or nine, weren't engaged with my, my oldness, that, uh, uh, but they were. They, they realized that... Uh, Parents of their friends were a full generation and more younger than I am, more than a full generation younger. They noticed I wear hearing aids. They noticed my gray hair. They noticed I'm not so great on the basketball court anymore. Um, and uh, that was, I think, Tad's approach to that. Timmy's approach was the opposite. It was he came out one night just bawling, saying, "You're going to die, and I'm not going to have a dad." And uh, I couldn't lie. I just held him and said, I know. I love you. Well, maybe we could talk about something a little different at this point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Switching from kids. This is an extension of the kids, in a way. Uh, some of the, you've got recurring chapter titles and themes throughout the book. And one of them is The Magic Show. And you write about the elaborate family productions that you put on and the family puts on for friends. And I wonder if you could talk about what learning magic provided you as a child and how does magic, how does it re relate to writing? What a great question. It's, it's been my hobby since I was seven or eight, real, very young. I, I remember going to New York with my dad on a convention. There was a famous magic store called Lou Tannen's. And the bravest act of my life up to then was to walk through the streets of New York to find this place at a young age. Um, it began as an escape from uh, some bad stuff in my childhood. It was a way of going into the basement and getting away from what was happening upstairs. My dad was an alcoholic. Uh, he was institutionalized twice that I know of. Uh, there was tension inside this house. Dinner was tough, just getting through it. Uh, vodka bottles hidden all over the house and in the garage. And I'd empty them and put water in them as a little boy. He was a great human being. It was chemistry. It wasn't that he was evil. It, it, it was 
what happens when alcohol begins to eat up your spirit and your soul and your and nothing else matters. Um, and a way of escaping that tension was to go in the basement and do magic tricks where I was living in this, this illusory world of things are fine. If I can make a, my day, if I can make a penny disappear from my hand and have it change into a white mouse, maybe I'll be able to make my dad stop drinking. Um, hoping for the impossible. But in magic, it, the, the miracles can happen. And so it began that way. And I've continued doing it, except for a few, maybe a few years of not doing it. And I've gotten a lot better at it. I can do slide, I can make card after card after card appear and show my hands empty and grab more out of the air. I've gotten really good at it. The difficulty has been for the kids is that they stand behind me. <laughs> so to them, it's not magic. They know how it's done, and they, they say, why do, you, why do you keep doing this? It's so easy. It's not easy. It's the hardest thing you can do. <laughs> and, uh, it's, but we do put on, uh, every, maybe every two or three years, we put on a one-and-a-half-hour, two-hour full-scale um, uh, extravaganza with some former students, friends of mine and of my wife. We have costumes and music, and we dance, and we sing. There's a plot to the show. One year it was set in a desert casino. It had a, you know, a horny uh, uh, cocktail waitress that everybody's turning down, and, uh, and all, all kinds of characters throughout it all, but magic, like a 180 tricks in that show, with the hope that it becomes so, there are so many of them, you can't stop to think, to, to figure them out, because here comes the next one, here's the next one, and to sort of live in this illusory world that this magic all around. Somebody, if the waiter brings somebody a drink at a blackjack table, and magic happens, a bottle of wine appears in his hands, things like that, just one after the other. Um, some of these, uh, for, for this show, a roulette table sat in our, our uh, foyer, the entryway to our house, for seven months. <laughs> and so the UPS guy would come, and he'd, he'd look, think like they were having a legal gambling thing going on here. I mean, who knows what they thought. It, it was not a real, but it looked like a real one, and it, magic happened on it. So it's been a... It's been a it, it, it's a, it went from escape to a different kind of escape. It's much like writing a book. That the, the people in this book, the new one, are they're real people, but words are not people, and you can't put people in a book unless you have a lot of food and water and a really big book. They're words. <laughs> So you're, it, there's the illusion that you're reading about my background, in Vietnam, and my children, and the stories that I'm telling in the book, but it is an illusion. Uh, you're, not, you're getting it through the medium of, of language. And uh, to me, writing a book is very much like doing sleight of hand. It feels the same to me. The miracle of creating a scene. Oh, I mean, it's the hard work that goes into it. And, as it does with practicing sleight of hand, but it, it, it feels so miraculous when a scene comes alive um, that it feels like I'm doing miracles. Well, seg segueing off that magical writing theme, in the things they carry, you distinguish between happening truth and story truth. And I'm wondering if these ideas in some way can be applied to nonfiction, i.e. Non this memoir in particular. Oh, very much. Part of what I just said was kind of a half answer to that question, the sense of it's not real, the things you're reading, um, because there's, this, it's, uh, there's this, these language things. So people are making their own images out of these words. And that's, that's happening with the reader. The reader is building pictures of me and Timmy and my dad and Tad and my wife. And, but they're, 
So there, it's not the real world exactly. On top of that, memory is faulty, especially mine. <laughs> and and uh, I, I think if I were to ask any of the people in the audience tonight, or you, and certainly myself, tell me about yesterday. How much do you really remember? Every word that came out of your mouth, do you remember them all? And the words that came out of your television sets and your radios, and when did the newspaper, what did you read about? And that's yesterday. And what about three weeks ago? And in my case, 50 years ago, when I think about Vietnam, I do believe that we more or less erase our, our lives as we live them. They, they, which cabbage do I pick out at the Safeway? And, you don't remember so much of what you think is your life. And so when I go to write about the real world, I'm doing it not with an absolute grasp on what occurred. For example, I was wounded in Vietnam. I can't remember much of it. I can remember a hand grenade on the ground fizzling. It was a handmade, we called them chai com grenades. Look like a little can of uh, Hunt's tomato paste, about that big, a small can. It's fizzling. And I, have a, I know my back, I don't remember turning my back to it, but I know I did, because my next memory is maybe three seconds, two seconds later, and I, the words, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, coming either out of my mouth, which I'm not sure about, or in my head, one of the two. I don't remember the grenade exploding. Uh, and the next memory is of a bee sting sensation. Um, and then maybe five minutes went by, and I remember looking over my shoulder, surprised, am I in the real world or am I dead? And seeing a kid named Clausen holding his stomach. Uh, I was lucky, I was wearing a military radio that took most of the blast, thank God. Um, he wasn't. So. When you go to write about an event like that, you're partly, you partly have the real world, but you partly have this, this surreal feeling of, did this really happen? Did it, is it real? And then 50 years go by, and all that time, was I really in a war? I remember my dad's last years, we had, uh, this is again in the book, but, um, we were, we'd come to a kind of peace between us. I, I wasn't sure he liked me, much less loved me. I wasn't sure of that, but, and still am not totally, but we had a kind of peace when he was old, in his 90s, and we were having a cigarette out on a patio in his retirement home where my mom and he were living. And I asked him, what had happened to your medals from World War II? They used to be in your desk, in your, sock drawer. We kept his socks. And he said, what medals? And I said, uh, medals from World War II. And, and he said, was I in a war? <laughs> and I said, yeah, you, you were at Iwo Jima and Okinawa, and you were in a war. And maybe five minutes, we changed topics and went somewhere else. But after five minutes, he was in, he was in, had a, he was in, he wasn't in senile dementia entirely, but he was going that way, kind of in and out. But after five minutes, he said, oh yeah, yeah, those goddamn kamikazes. You sail off to war, you, you know, the youngest man in the world, and you come home the oldest man in the world. And uh, that's, that, makes me tear up because it's a beautiful sentence. It's not, it's not just the sentiment. It's you go to war young and you come home old and changed and changed forever. And so he did have that recollection of change. So those, those memories are not about war. They're about, they're huge. It's about humanity and the, the, the uh, the selectivity of our own memories and what we cherish and value. Well, you mentioned your father with regard to some of the Hemingway analyses in the book. Yes. And they're some of my favorite pieces. Thank um, you. 
the Timmy, Tad, and Papa and I sections. Can you talk about why it was so important for you to assign Hemingway stories to the boys and what you hoped they'd learn and how the stories affected you? Well, I'm not a, I'm not a Hemingway aficionado. I'm not, yeah, I love some stories. Some, they're, they're just beautiful. They're flawless. Other stories I quarrel with. I wanted, my dad won when I was young, maybe eight or nine came into my bedroom one Saturday afternoon in July or August. It was a hot afternoon, and he was carrying this big, fat book of Hemingway stories. And I think he had decided to be a father because he said, I want you to pick five of these stories. I want you to read them, and I want you to talk to me about them. And then he left. And I'm eight years old, or nine. <laughs> and, 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 and I'm sick of school, it's the summer, and I looked through the book and I found the shortest stories I could find in the book. One of them was one page long, a very short story, one of his great stories. Um, I, I read Cat in the Rain, which I thought, how could it, the story has no story. It's, I, 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 I had no idea why, why a writer would write such a terrible story. It just baffled. Now it's among my dearest and most cherished of all his stories, but back then I was just totally baffled. The story is of a woman looking out a window and seeing a cat in the rain. And there's a little tension going on I th between her husband and the woman. She goes out, looks for the cat, it's not there. She comes back up, and then a maid brings a cat in. Maybe it's the same cat, a different cat, end of story. That's it. <laughs> on the surface, there's all whole bunch going on underneath, the, underneath that story. But I didn't see it as a kid anyway. What I recalled 50 years later when I began writing this book of my own was I remember waiting for my dad to come home. So, so fearful, what could I possibly say to him? I had nothing to say about a clean, well-lighted place. Except, how come that guy at the end couldn't remember the words to the Lord's Prayer? That begins with, you know, my father out and not and not to be there about, you know. I didn't get that it was a riff on nothingness. All I got was, well, how, how come the guy couldn't remember the words? Even I, at eight years old, can remember. I, nothing to say. My dad didn't ever mention that book to me ever again. He went off drinking, came home late at night, drunk. Uh, I think he thought that he forgot that he decided to be a father. But the memory of my fear... Uh, lasts. So I duplicated some of what my dad tried with my kids on a more modest scale. I didn't give them a whole book, but singly I would ask them to read a story or two. I gave them a very short story. It's one page long by Hemingway. It's the story of a, a romance during World War I that fails. A guy comes home and at the end catches gonorrhea in the back of a taxi cab. So my I gave it to Timmy, and he came in and said, I said, what did you think? And he said, well, I was embarrassed. And I said, what was so embarrassing? He said, it's embarrassing when your dad gives you a book to read, or a story to read about sex diseases. <laughs> and and it's, the same phenomenon happened in several other of the stories where it was taken... The Killers was a story about, uh, I'm, I'm sure almost all of you have read it, I know Andy has, but almost all of you are literary people, and, but it's very briefly, it's a story of a boxer who has either failed to uh, take a fall in a, in a fight, or has taken, has, has fallen, he wasn't supposed to, somebody, a gambler has paid him, and his name is Ole, and he's on the run, and he ends up in a small Illinois town. Nick Adams shows up, uh, and two killers come in to kill this the boxer. And the boxer, Nick goes to warn him, and the boxer says, I'm tired of running. I'm not going to run. I'm going to lie here and take it. I'm paraphrasing, but he says, I'm tired of running. So I asked Timmy after he read it, what did you think of when Ole said, I'm tired of running. I'm going to let people kill me. And Timmy said, I wasn't thinking of that. And I said, what are you thinking of? And he said, well, don't boxers get hit in the face? And I said, yeah. And he said, don't they hit other people in the face? And I said, yeah. And he said, I was thinking, 
why would anybody ever want to be a boxer? <laughs> that would make, it makes me laugh, and also it's, I thought, what I, I got, this is a brilliant literary thing to, that uh, Hemingway didn't intend, but you, different people are going to draw different things out of stories based on their backgrounds and values, temperaments, and an author is only partly in control, and maybe not even half in control, of what is going to happen inside a reader's heart and head as a story is read. And it, God knows happened to me a lot of times. I'm so, totally shocked by responses to things I've, re I've written. Well, speaking of being shocked and writer's intent, and can you talk about how some, that sometimes goes awry? And I'm thinking in particular about the story, The Man I Killed. Right. If you could talk to the audience about that. Um, yeah, I, I was giving a reading in Chicago. I don't ordinarily give readings. I think books are meant to be read privately. I don't like audio tapes, for example, and things like that. I, I like to stop and pause, whereas an audio tape just keeps coming at you. You can't. And I gave a reading and started, I choked up over it. It's a story called a man I, The Man I Killed, and it's a story that's based on not, it's made up, but it it's, comes out of all these corpses around me in Vietnam. I didn't know, and still don't know, if I, ever, if I killed anyone because you can't see bullets hit things. And because it's so chaotic, and because sometimes your eyes are closed, you're just spraying the whole green living world, mostly out of terror, making this equivalent of saying, go, go away, Leave, don't, don't try to kill me. Uh, and the result were all these dead people. Um, some friends of mine, but a lot of Vietnamese, and that story was a way of trying to take responsibility, though I'll never know if my, a bullet from my weapon killed anyone. I was there. I was a soldier. I pulled the trigger. I hated the war. I was opposed to it. I went anyway. I shouldn't have done that. But I was too young. I couldn't say no to my own country and to my mom and dad and my hometown. I would have felt humiliated and uh, that people would be talking about me in this small town I grew up in. So I didn't have the courage to do it. So, so that's what was making me cry up on the stage. I wasn't bawling. It was like the chess jokes. I'd sort of start to, and then I, could, I got it under control. And afterward, uh, a young man of 21, 22, somewhere in there, came up to me and said, I want to thank you for being so honest up there. and uh, for showing your heart. And he gave me a big hug. And he turned and started to walk away, and then he stopped and turned around again and said, by the way, I want to tell you, I've been thinking about joining the Marine Corps, and now I know I'm going to. So I go back to my hotel room, as you do after these events, people around you here, and then you go back, you're all by yourself, and you look in the mirror, and you feel like this failure, like this dumb yo-yo, where you're trying to display something so nasty that's lived inside me for all these years, and the, it, it's taken in a completely different way. And I think that's more common than it's uncommon. I think that books and readers brush up against each other, but they don't always go like that. It, like strangers having a short conversation and off. And it's another example of control. You can, as a writer, can only do so much, which is to tell a story and then hope that the story will, don't explain it and don't, just let it be. And whatever it does to a human being's heart and head, you have to trust the story. Sometimes it fails. Uh, and sometimes it succeeds in ways you don't expect, and sometimes it fails in ways you don't expect. It's the hardest thing for me to have learned over all these years about writing is that I, ha I have to trust the story to do its own work without trying to um, explain anything about it. Just getting out of its way. Getting out of the story's way, yeah. 
Have you made peace with the idea that you are primarily considered a Vietnam writer? Do you consider yourself a Vietnam writer? In one way, yes, um, but mostly no. That when I write about the war in Vietnam or any other war, I'm not writing about bullets and bombs and military maneuvers and saluting and flanking tactics and how you, the mechanics of it all, it, not in that sense. I'm, I feel that I'm writing, really, I'm a peace writer, what I think. I'm trying to display the horrors of it all, not just the physical horrors, mostly the internal ones that you carry with you after the peace treaties are signed and the war has been over for 50 years and you're sitting at the dinner table with your children and you get, go silent and you just can't speak because there's something's intruding, at memories, something has sparked an, a picture in your head. Um, and I, 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 f I felt for my whole career that I was the opposite of a war writer. I thought I was a peace writer. So when I hear those words, it's a way of, of, of I don't know, compressing and pigeonholing and summarizing. You don't call Shakespeare a king writer, for Christ's sake. <laughs> and, and, and Joseph Conrad is an ocean writer. Like he writes about porpoises. It's ridiculous. And Toni Morrison is a black writer. Philip Roth, a Jew writer. It's ridiculous. There, we're all writer writers. We have our topics and the things that we bring to our stuff. Vietnam brought something to me, which was a moral issue. Is what, should we be killing people? And when do we stop? And when will it stop? And uh, things like that. And I sh is it the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do? Well, how do you say no to something that, that, you don't, that you're told to do that you think you shouldn't do? Uh, Things like that matter to me, but not war itself. So it troubles me. Um, I don't know, this is a public library. There's a dirty word in this little anecdote that I've got to say. Do you mind? Say it. All right. <laughs> We're a First Amendment shop. I've got to apologize to Timmy and Tad. They're not going to like this. And, um, They're going to love it. I was it. on a, we were in the Bahamas, and I was on a little, little tiny balcony writing about three in the morning. And... Uh, Tad woke up and came out and uh, said, what are you writing about? And you know this story, Andy. I said, well, I'm writing about being called, how I hate being called a war writer, which I write about in the book. And he said, um, well, what, what, what don't you like? And I said kind of what I said to you, you know, Shakespeare, King writer, blah, blah, blah. Uh, he didn't find it funny. Um, he said, well, at least they call you something. <laughs> and nice, nice, I got, and there was a, there was a dirty word, uh, I don't have to say the word, started with an F, <laughs> that I was getting angry at a guy named Norman Mailer who had called me, are you, he said to me, are you that Vietnam writer? And I instantly hated the guy, I mean, just, like, just in instantly. Even though he was totally cordial, he wasn't, it, I think he meant it in a benign sense, you know, that, oh, you know, but it still was a little pinch. I was like, are you that wife-beating writer? <laughs> but, but, uh, didn't, I didn't do that. I wish I had now. And, uh, and uh, th so there's this F word in there that I'm talking to Mailer that I'm, it's going on in my head. And Tad said, you, 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 you can't put that, F word in, in a book. If somebody reads it, you're going to be in big trouble. <laughs> and I said, I've got bigger troubles than that. I'm trying to write, a, to write about this war writing, pigeonholing thing. And he said, well, yeah. He went back into the room. It was like a sliding glass door. And then he stuck his head out. And he said, well, why don't you just tell them to go F themselves? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of when you saw, your question began with how you feel if I come to terms with it. I did it through Tad, kind of. Just when he says that, that's kind of how I feel. That's, that's like, like having American cheese written over your face or your Borden's milk. <laughs> if they want to do it, fuck them. <laughs> I knew we'd get there. <laughs> I tried to avoid it. But. So in the end, this book 
I'm, 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 here's my last question before we turn it over to the audience. Do you think the book is more about your fear that Timmy and Ted won't know you, or is it more about you learning how to say goodbye? What a great question to end on. Wow. I hadn't even considered it, but I think it's at least as much about the latter. How do you say goodbye? There's only one way. You can't speak from the grave. And it's, I think, to leave behind the beauty of shining love of some sort, that not, which I hope this book has in it, that it, amid those pages of the books, I hope some beauty comes out of it, of enduring, lasting love that will live somewhere in their hearts when they're 50 or 73, my age. Um, and it's not just love of them, it's love of kindness and love of human decency and generosity and um, otherness and love of being a good human being in addition to my love for the two beautiful boys. I think all of that shines through. I think you'll see that when you read the book. Tim O'Brien, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Thanks very much for coming down. Thank you. Uh, I hope you wouldn't mind about answering a question about the things they carried. Not at all. Um, so th some of the perfect stories in the language are in that book. And Thank you. one of them is The, the Sweetheart of Song Tra Bong. Mm -hmm. I've read it many times, and I've always won wanted to ask you, where does that come from? Is there something real underneath it, or is that right. just... Um, the story, Sweetheart of the Song, Trabong, was born in the real world. I heard us, when I first arrived in Vietnam, before I'd even gone out into the field, I was just, I'd just come to my company, just been in Vietnam a day. And there was a guy who was filling a sandbag, um, I don't, he wasn't a combat guy, he was just filling a sandbag, and he said, there was a girl here, um, and she was up in the mountains, and I didn't believe him, and, and uh, I heard it a couple more times. I came home, and I remember in Seattle, there was a guy who came through this a signing book signing line and said, I was in your area. Did you hear about this girl who was up in the mountains that her boyfriend had sent for her, and she came? And I still didn't believe it. And I heard it several more times. I still don't know if it's true or not. I don't really care whether it is. But I heard it so many times that I started asking myself, why don't I believe it? And it was just gender. That was it. A same age as I was and all my buddies were. And uh, by uh, cultural custom back then, we were only men served in combat. But there's nothing to stop anybody from buying a ticket in Cleveland and flying to LA. They're not going to stop you if you're a recent female college graduate or high school graduate. And they won't stop you in LA. Is that me? Nope. Somebody in the audience. Oh. If you I think turn I that off, to turn mine off, too, so I'm not blaming you. Uh, and you can fly from L.A. to Bangkok, and Bangkok, you can fly. No, nobody's going to stop you. There's nothing logical or nothing logistical that will stop you. You can do it. And once you're a good-looking cheerleader and you end up in Vietnam, you've got 500,000 people, who will, guys, will take you anywhere you want to go. You can do it. So th there was, it was it was the recognition, recognition of gender, partly. And then, feeding into it, I, before even beginning the story, there's a real-life woman named Lady Borton. And this library has a copy of, she's written, I think, two books. And she was in my area where the My Lai massacre had happened a year before I got there. That was full of these mines I talked to you about. It was just a deadly zone, probably the deadliest in all of Vietnam. It was just horrible. And she was a Quaker and was living in a, in a place called Quang Nai City, which was just a town. It wasn't a city. And by town, I mean maybe a thousand people back then, if that. Uh, and she was there uh, without a weapon in a place that we were terrified. A hundred of us, armed to the teeth, were just scared to death of this place and everything around this place. 
So the war ends, and all us macho guys have been home for 50 years, our pot bellies. And guess what? She's still there. 50 years later. So, um, it's, the story is an homage to a real person with real courage, real stubborn determination to do good in the world. And uh, she's not out marching on Veterans Day and so on. She's still doing her work. I think she's older than I am. She's close to my age for sure. So sometimes a story is born partly out of abstraction, the gender thing, but also there has to be a human thing that I have to, that has to make me passionate enough to write the story. Um, Vietnam veterans almost uniformly, without, I can think of no exceptions, uh, uh, don't like the story because they say, oh, that couldn't happen, that didn't happen, I never saw that. And in a way, that's accurate. I never saw Mary Ann Bell out there. I don't know if there was a real girl or not. Um, but my heart loves the story. And uh, because it's part of who, who I've become. Thank you. Right here in the second row. Have you been back to Vietnam since the war? And if you have, what were your impressions? And if you have not, why not? I have been back. I, I went back reluctantly. Uh, not, not out of psychological reasons. I went back because I hate airplanes. I'm sitting, I'm a smoker. And 24 hours without smoking is dangerous for my health. <laughs> I mean, I'll die. I'm gonna, I'll go insane. I'll jump out of the airplane. I really hate it. But my, uh, I had a girlfriend at the time. She wanted to go back and see why I cussed in the night and woke up, you know, with dreams. So I went and I loved the, uh, I, saw, I, I, I saw a new Vietnam. What I saw as a soldier was a war. The word Vietnam equaled war and nothing else, really. That's all it was. It was all around me. And it equaled terror and it equaled um, moral guilt and things like that. But on that trip, uh, I found, for example, the place where that grenade episode happened I mentioned earlier tonight, the exact spot where I lay, but in a spot where such horror was unfolding, not just that grenade, every, every, the whole this rice paddy was just bubbling with machine gun fire, just total horror. Now at peace, and this yellow s sunlight striking the rice, and there was a little boy, maybe, I don't know, 100 yards away, kind of waving at me. Um, and the, the beauty and serenity of that place now occupies at least a portion of my memory. I saw them both. The horror is not going to ever go away. But now alongside it, there's, there's, the, there's this beautiful thing called peace that's inside my head now, too. Um, so I'm so glad I went and uh, have, have new pictures in my head. Is that any way, in any way a balance, or is it just simple simultaneity? These two things just exist simultaneous, and I don't one think, doesn't yeah, but inform they, they the They coexist. Other. I wouldn't say quite simultaneously, that when bad things come into my head, I'm absorbed by them. Uh, the grenade incident and many others I could mention. But the next day, the next hour, a memory of, of that little boy. I remember an old woman sitting near on a, on a paddy dike too. Just, I just remembered this. I'd forgotten this now for since 1994 when I went there. She uh, had a translator with me, and she was speaking to this old woman on, sitting on a paddy dike, just staring at us. And uh, she, the translator came over and she said, uh, be, "Be really careful." And I said, "About what?" And she said, "Well, uh, four of her children were." killed in an airstrike on her village. So be really careful about 
I said, can I at least talk to her? She said, no, don't talk to her. Um, so that, that memory is there, too, that by and large, it, I, I felt uh, weirdly forgiven for all the horrors. But I think that woman, like this guy, would have a difficult time forgiving if someone had killed Timmy and Tad. Um, I can't imagine the, the forgiveness. I hope I could be that way, but I don't think I could be. That's a demerit against me, I guess. Um, but I can't lie either and say I wouldn't be full of grief and anger. I think I wouldn't be. What would, what would you advise your sons if they wanted to enlist? Well, I probably wouldn't. I probably would not. I'd tell a story of some sort. I'd have to think about what the story is going to be, but I'd have time. I'd say, I don't, have to, I don't have to answer you right now. Let me think about it. And I'd try to do it through an anecdote or a story, maybe made up, maybe out of the real world. But I'm sure I wouldn't say, don't do it or do it. Um, my dad and mom both treated me that way when I got drafted. They knew I was opposed to the war. They knew I was terrified of going. They didn't believe in it. And uh, didn't, that I didn't want to die. And I didn't want to kill people. But they never s said, do it or don't do it. They let me, they showed their love for me. And uh, more or less, without direction. And I'm not sure that tell them telling me to do things, I think that would have gotten in the way of making my mind up. It would have been, oh, it would have gone from what's the morally right thing to do. It would have gone to, oh, mom said go and dad said don't. I'd be thinking about that and not about the thing itself. It uh, uh, was plaguing me. So, but I would tell some kind of a story. Maybe one you heard tonight. The, um, at one point, Timmy asked me, are you a pacifist? And I said, yes. Uh, and Timmy said, well, what if somebody really mean and nasty broke into the house and had a gun and was trying to kill me? What would you do? And I said, well, I'd try to talk to him. And Timmy said, yeah, but what if he's super mean and super nasty and is going to kill me? Would you kill him? And I said, yeah, I'd try to. And he said, what kind of pacifist is that? <laughs> <laughs> I said the father kind. <laughs> and uh, it's, that's the thing about my life. That's maybe the thing we started with. I don't believe in killing people. I believe we should do everything we can avoid not to do it. It's forever. What if you're wrong? There's this absolutism thing. When you kill people, it's absolute. They're dead. You can't wake them up if you're wrong. If there are no weapons of mass destruction, you can't wake them up and say, sorry. It's forever. So, but everything that I think I believe about the world is, is um, adjusted and modified by a qualification of some sort in which then Timmy found one where I had to admit that there's a contradiction in my personality and uh, to live with that 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 absence of constancy in my value system. It's not absolute. And very little in my life has uh, ever been that way. Hemingway has been mentioned. Would you share with us other writers and specific books that yes. you would like your sons to read as they grow into adulthood? Excellent question. Revolutionary Road by Richard Yates. I'd have my kids read. It's one of the most beautiful books by an American I've ever read. Not maybe it has its equals, but it's really beautiful. 
Uh, it's a story about a marriage that, go, that goes sour and dreams not coming true. Uh, man and wife develop a kind of fantasy of we'll get, we'll get away from the staleness of our lives and we'll, I think it's go to France. I read it years, I'm pretty sure, to Paris. And it never, come, it never comes true. It's a sad book, but it's such a deeply human and loving book about desperation with which we pursue personal happiness and beauty in our lives. And if you don't have it, you want to try whatever you can do, including escape to somewhere else to find it. Uh, Turgenev's Fathers and Sons, I would recommend uh, any, anybody who uh, loves the, the, the mix of contention and love that happens between fathers and sons. Um, it's, 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 there are two fathers and two sons in this uh, beautiful novel. There's also another novel by Turkenev Turken, I'd recommend, which is called First Love. It's about a little a boy who falls in love with a woman. Yeah, I think the boy is like 17, the woman's like 20-something. And it's his first love, and it turns out that the woman is his father's mistress. And it's heartbreaking. It was, it was decried in, in Russia when it was written as too light. But I didn't find it light. I found, I found it heartbreaking and a little spooky. Uh, Flaubert loved it. He'd written a letter to Kenya saying how much he loved it. Um, uh, there's a short story by Andre de Boos, the elder, uh, called A Father's Story. That if you read this story and don't feel you've been changed forever, I'd be shocked. It, it, it changed me and every, everybody I know who has read it has felt as I do. There's never been anybody who said that didn't do anything to me. It, it's, you can find it, I think, online. You don't have to buy a book. You can just read. You should. By on, he's got written many beautiful stories, or you should check it out at the library for sure. There's one difficulty with answering that question, though, which is memory again. I'm on a stage, and you asked a question, and I've, I'm sure there, there are Lolita, I mean, I love her whole thing, the, this gifted pervert who's, who almost convinces the reader that what what he's doing, which is pedophilia, is good. Uh, it's shocking. And we're the, sort of this guy's jury, you know. With, he, he calls it love and so on, and we call it, you know, child molestation. And he's, he's, he's so nimble of mind and so gifted with language that he almost convinces you that this is a good thing. But the word almost matters a lot. Uh, and so I, I've left out so many books that I've loved. You'll come back. <laughs> oh, good, I'd love to. This is what, this is what, I just love being here. Andy and I have been friends for, I don't know how many years, like 25 or something like 90, that or more. 91. God. While. Wow. I'm not. Since before I was a lot older born. than I am. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, wor I'm working on it. I wasn't born until 92. <laughs> Hi, thank you for being here. As I was sitting here waiting for you to come on stage, I just read the first chapter of your book, and it's really beautiful and um, a, a wonderful gift to give to your sons. Thank you. But what I would like to ask about is in the Lake of the Woods. Um, I'm a college professor, and, and I taught that novel a lot, and my students loved it. Of course, I recognized the magic tricks that you were talking about. Right. And my students really loved it, but they were kind of frustrated they didn't know what happened to Kathy. And I'm not going to ask you what happened to her, but I'm just That's a good question. but I just wonder <laughs> if while you were writing it, you knew what happened to her. Well, I'm the author, and I don't know what happened. <laughs> um, that, and that's why I, I wrote that book. I wanted to write a book where I don't know the what. what this goes back to this explaining thing I was talking about a long, like a half hour ago. I wanted to, I want, I wanted to be mystified by my own characters. Uh, a woman vanishes, uh, and uh, a bunch of hypotheses are offered to what happened to her. 
And I don't know what, as an author, I don't want to know. I'm, I'm beguiled and tantalized by the unknown and even by the unknowable. What happens when we die? Do we, is there a heaven or a hell? And is St. Peter really going to be there in person? And, or is it symbolic? I don't know, and none of us are going to know. And, and maybe, maybe there's nothing to know. Who knows? I'm tantalized by Amelia Earhart. Every other week on the Discovery Channel, there's a new, you know, her, sh <laughs> her shoe found <laughs> the shores of Borneo or something. And, or she was, and I'm tantalized by Lizzie Borden. Did she take an ax and do that? She was found innocent. And she never confessed. On the other hand, she was the only person in the house with these two dead people. <laughs> and there was a maid who was outside washing windows, but would periodically come into the house, who took, you know, but Lizzie was tried, found innocent. She never confessed. I don't know. O.J. Simpson, uh, I have my opinions about what happened, but there were no eyewitnesses. And anyway, I'm tantalized on the plot sense by things I don't know, but I'm mostly tempted and tantalized by what I don't know about myself, why I do, why I'm sitting up here now. I could have, I could explain, give you rational things. My preference would be to be right now with Timmy and Tad watching myself on YouTube <laughs> from you know, two months from now. Um, it's not that I dislike being here. I love it. I love this book. I wouldn't. That's part of the ex why I'm here. I guess that. Um, this, this beauty thing, something shining for the boys. But In Lake of the Woods was written as a book where what began as a mystery is going to remain one. I warn the reader on page 15, if you're looking for a solution, buy another book. You're not going to get it, so I played fair. That, but solved mysteries aren't mysteries. They're solved. They aren't, they're un, they're un -mysteries. So in this library, you ought to go to the mystery section. <laughs> And they ought to just change the title, Unmysteries. <laughs> Every book. <laughs> all of them are solved. They're unmysteries. And, and I wanted to write one that was a mystery even to me. And I know it sounds facetious, but I earnestly mean what I'm saying. That I, I am fascinated by what is unknown. What were Custer's last thoughts at the Little Bighorn? What were they? Well, we're not, we can't know it. Was he, was he aware that he, had, he was about to receive exactly what he had came, come prepared to deliver? Death of, in this case, you know, Native American Indians. He was, that's what he came and he was getting it. And did he see the irony? And I doubt it from what I've read of Custer, but maybe, who knows? Um, mystery in life is, it just, it's kind of what I live for. I don't want... If, some, if I know something, I want to unknow it so I can be f full of wonder and awe at this world we live in. Well, we're full of wonder and awe. Ladies and gentlemen, Tim O'Brien. Thank you. Thank you.